thank you everyone for having me here today. Unfortunately, I was unable to come this year to CakeFest, which was super sad for me. Uh, I had some inconvenience this year, but I'm also glad that I had this opportunity of still presenting my talk to you. And um, I heard that Mark did a super amazing job with Jorge running the workshops this year. So I'm glad that everything went fine anyways. So um, I bring you this keynote today. And it is, a, it is a talk with a hybrid topic, I would say. Uh, it is hybrid because it will touch aspects of programming, but with the perspective of development as a person in general. And you'll discover how I came to this topic uh, in a couple of minutes. So whoever is my designated slides man, please, please, please uh, can you show the first slide? I only see black in my screen, which is not great. I'm not sure what I'm presenting right now. So I'll start as soon as I can see my slide on the screen. Just waiting. OK. Uh, if you can go back to the first slide, just 10 ways to improve. Thank you. I can see it now. So 10 ways to improve. I came up with this collection of 10 small tips or maybe directions that I discovered myself in this also a bit more than 10 years of developing for a, an open source project. Uh, not just KPHP, but also I've been contributing to other projects. So 10 ways to improve is basically my 10 tips for growing a were ever the best criteria. So it's not as easy to answer. So given the difficulty of answering this question, I think that for me it is more important, since I'm a part of an open source project, to answer a different question. Since uh, from my perspective, I cannot convince everyone to use my project or to make this project the best project ever, given any success criteria that you can come up with. So I started to wonder, next slide, what makes a good contributor? So this is also a difficult question, if you think about it for a couple seconds, more than a couple seconds, sorry. So is it a good contributor, someone who dedicates a fixed amount of time to their project, who are responsive in terms of like, if there's a bug in the in the issue tracker, uh, should they respond promptly? Or is it a good contributor, one who has a vision to show uh, what to do next? Is it a good contributor, someone who 
who creates the best code? Well, there are many different types of good contributors. So it would be also quite difficult to answer this question in a, in a short way or to, to provide a single definition. So next slide is for me, what I have discovered in these 10 years is that contributing to open source is just about uh, developing yourself constantly. So it's not so much about uh, developing a code base, it has a lot to do with developing your relationship with the people of the project. So with the other contributors, your relationship with, uh, with the goals of the project itself and the relationship you create yourself with whatever you're developing, which it can be a healthy relationship or a very sick and toxic one. Next slide, please. So, in short, I would say that this is not just about open source or a project or a community. I think that in general, just being a programmer is about constant per personal improvement. So, I would like to, to make you think for a few minutes, uh, why are you a programmer? Or why are you maybe contributing to some open source project? Why are you developing a specific project? What are the reasons? Is it for the money? Is it for the people? Is it to become famous? Is it to be uh, popular? So I've, I've been having each one of these goals throughout my 10 years. So they've been changing over and over again uh, to, to, to be transformed in a way year over year. So the thing that uh, resulted out of this process was not uh, a very, very technical question, like I want to produce the best software ever. It was more a philosophical question, which is in the next slide. So for me, what makes a good open source project, next slide please, What makes a good open source project is also answering this question. What makes a good person? So in my view, if we can collect in a way uh, uh, some sort of amount of good people developing a project, then whatever comes out of it is worthy. It, it was worth the effort. Mm, regardless of it being popular or the best software ever or uh, Someone, something that changed the world in a significant way. I think that just being around a good group of people and being able to develop yourself in a significant way was worth the effort. Next slide. So back again, I bring you the 10 learnings that I got uh, from this process. And it's 10 ways to improve. Next slide, please. The first tip is to pay attention to your judgments. I think I, I said this as the first tip because I think from this moment on, or from, from this first step, the, the next one will just follow. So next slide. I think most of you can agree with me when I say that programmers we tend to be very judgmental. Uh, we love criticizing code. We love criticizing other projects. We love criticizing software. We love criticizing uh, developing practices. But we do not realize that we are, or we tend to criticize uh, people or things without thinking what was the history or what history was that led this person or led this project to the shape they are today. And we think that the reasons that apply to them do not apply to us. I hope that's clear in a way. So 
what I intend to say is that it is easy to project our insecurities and our fears onto other people and onto other projects. We are not as popular as a project because, and then whatever comes out from this, uh, it's better to, I don't know, take it with a fine grain of salt. Maybe it's not real what you're saying, maybe it's not true, maybe just a fear that you have because you're not considering the history of what you're criticizing. Something that you see very commonly in, in chats or like group discussions such as Reddit is that most people will feel more comfortable uh, adopting the group's view. So if, today's, uh, if today a project is popular, then everyone will gather around this project and criticize the rest. If one particular development practice uh, suddenly becomes popular for a person and, and this person convinces uh, an, another amount of people, then the group view will go into that direction and start criticizing and ostracizing the rest. So we feel more comfortable being with the bullies than standing for their own, for, for our own, sorry. And, and this is very natural and this is very human. So the first step or the first tip that I want you to maybe try for a few days is to pay attention to your judgments. Next slide, please. So uh, here are a few tips that I apply myself sometimes. And the first or, or the only thing that I want you to do, if, if you follow me or you want to try this, is to just observe. You don't have to stop judging. You don't have to change your judgment. Just observe them and see what happens. So observe when you want to judge someone, when you want to criticize someone, just observe it. Pay attention to this need that you have inside of you. Pay attention to this idea that you need to act on this and correct someone on the internet. So when you want to log into Reddit and correct someone for what they're saying, uh, or maybe when you would prefer to share something on Reddit, just to name something or a forum or a Stack Overflow, and you do not do it because you think you're going to be criticized, that's also a judgment. So just observe it. And take a few moments to realize how it feels on the inside to judge. Is it a nice sensation? Is it something you're happy with? And most importantly, does it bring any value to yourself? This And whatever comes out as an answer to that, you should act upon. If it's okay uh, for you to keep judging, you may be right. Judging is not bad by itself, but I just want you to observe how it feels like to judge. So why pay attention to your judgment? It's because when you pay attention, then you will become less likely to judge without uh, a good reason or you will not do it as harsh as you would at the beginning do. So if we pay attention to our judgments, I have experienced that you create a healthier community and a better work environment around you, where people is more open to share ideas, to develop these ideas, and to bring them together to work. Okay? Um, Doing this talk is also very difficult for me because I cannot see your faces, so <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm talking to no one. Can you change the next, to the next slide, uh, Dakota? Okay. So one way of practicing the attention to judgment is by writing code, by having teaching it as a goal. So how does this work? Next slide. Imagine that you are going to produce some greenfield code, like from scratch, and the, your goal, instead of just producing a code that is nice, that does the job that you, it was intended to do, imagine that you had to also teach it to someone. That right after you write it, you need to explain to someone how the API works. How is this software supposed to work? 
If someone has to change it, how is it supposed to be changed? What are your visions for the future for this software? So try writing a small tutorial, ideally first, before you write the code, and see if any decisions that you initially thought you had for the project or for this software uh, change at all. And in the process of creating this tutorial and, and creating this like API for your software, be mindful of how it feels to teach it. Are you maybe thinking that other people will be dumb when you explain it? Or will you think perhaps that you are not as able to create good software? So just observe this, uh, these reactions that you have to the code that you're writing and to the tutorial you're writing. And uh, one thing that I have found particularly useful is identifying resistance to change something. When something is difficult to explain, it's probably because it's also complex. Or maybe you are adding complexity without a reason to. So if you feel resistance to change something, try to see why are you clinging to this opinion. So uh, one example, and this is this is maybe a, a super superfluous example. Uh, back in the days, I don't know how much time that was, like two years maybe, that we implemented PSR2, three years, uh, the recommendation for the PHP standards group, the frameworks group, uh, that dictated in a way or recommended how to structure your code visually, like the indentation rules and where to put your curly braces. Well, I was quite resistant to it because I have been developing with a different style for years, so why should it change? But this resistance meant nothing to no one at the end. I was very, uh, I don't know, it took me no time to adjust to the new standard. And it, at the end, I think it paid off quite nicely for the project because we could just copy paste from other projects and the visually the PHP code would look the same as other projects. So it's a very superfluous example, but in a way it shows that Sometimes we're just resistant to changing something uh, in the way we program for the wrong reasons, just because we want to be right about something when there's no need to. Next slide. This is a shout out to Mark Story because he was the first one to show me this way of developing, which is write the documentation first. I think he does it in, in a really great way when he opens a ticket and he explains what his plans are for a particular feature. He creates some sort of API and then people will ping pong some extra ideas for it. And usually it turns out, turns out really well. So thank you, Mark, for that. Next slide. So, the previous two tips basically bring me to this other, which is to be mindful. Next slide. To be mindful, well, I could maybe do one, two, three, or three hours of, of a keynote about this topic, which I, I pretty much like. But I'm just going to summarize what it entails for me, or what it means. To be mindful, is just applying the two previous tips in your life, which is to pay attention to what you do without judging, or maybe just observe your judgment, which includes not judging yourself for whatever you're doing. The benefit of this is that you become less reactive to whatever you're doing or to whatever thing is happening on the outside. So if someone criticizes your job, instead of becoming reactive and defensive about it, or if someone comes with an idea like, let's change all the styles, the style guideline for the project, you just don't react immediately to it. You just observe how you feel about it, and maybe you decide that it's not worth getting angry because it's not a great deal. Okay, so, one thing that is important to always keep in mind is that you are not the code you write. 
the code I wrote 10 years ago is not a reflection of the code I write today. It doesn't resemble in any way. So the person who wrote this code 10 years ago cannot be the same person, yet I am still the same person in a way, right? The only thing that changed is my view of the world, of my view of how to develop a program. So when someone criticizes your code, uh, maybe don't feel attacked because you are not the code you write. The code you write is just a reflection of the state of mind that you are today. And this state of mind can change at any time. And this same thing applies to other people. They are not the code they write. So when uh, you see some code that you think is not very well written or very well architectured, uh, do not try to think that this person is also a bad person in a way. I think we all do it a bit unconsciously. But um, just keep in mind that there are reasons uh, for people not doing their best sometimes. Maybe they were tired, maybe they were confused, maybe they didn't understand the requirements for a particular feature. So try to separate in your mind these two concepts. Like the products of the mind of someone is not necessarily their own mind. Next slide. Okay, so if you are mindful uh, about things in life and being mindful again, it means to pay attention without judgment or without making it worse in a way, then we can actually start using errors or mistakes as something useful in our life. So instead of errors being uh, something to avoid, it can be also things to be celebrated. Actually, in some companies uh, that I know, errors are also celebrated as something, uh, like as an achievement in the company life. They not only embrace the success or celebrate the success, for example, the, a big sale or uh, reaching a big milestone, but mistakes are also celebrated. Why? Because we can learn from the mistakes. If had we not made the mistake, then we wouldn't have the experience of what happens when we do this particular thing. Next slide. And this is because to make mistakes is very human. We're bound to make mistakes all the time. Alexander Pope, who was a, a poet in the 1700s, he wrote this very famous phrase, to err is human, and he wrote it actually in an inter interesting context. He wrote it uh, when speaking about criticizing literature. And he said that we need more critics in literature, so we need people to criticize the work we do. And this is a very healthy view of error. So I'm bound to make mistakes at some point, and this is okay because it will make me learn. Next slide. So a question for an open source project or any software base in general is like, how can we leverage errors as teaching devices? If we're bound to make mistakes, if we're bound to make errors at any point, everyone makes errors, and uh, probably you can agree with me that uh, making mistakes or dealing with mistakes, dealing with errors, dealing with bugs is probably the most boring part of your job as a developer. So I think that most of you would rather just develop something than deal with the problems, than deal with Maybe not the problems, but deal with the bug, deal with an unexpected behavior that you don't know. Okay, I can agree that sometimes dealing with an unexpected, mysterious thing on your system is fun to debug and, and fix, but in general, that's probably not something you would rather do the rest of your life. So 
since errors are so common in life, how can we use the errors? How can we use the mistakes to point to the solution for that error? If we already know the solution for most mistakes you make when you code, I think that everyone could agree with that. Uh, most of the exceptions you get in code, we know the reasons. We usually have like a checklist of things to, to do for solving an error. So why not leverage this list that we already know for pointing out the solution to someone? And I think that one of the dif difficulties in doing that is that we need to think with a beginner's mind again. So people who went already through the experience of gathering this list of tips, of, of to-dos when a, an error is, uh, when an error happens, well, these people lost the beginner's mind. So it makes it more difficult for them to transmit this knowledge to people who are learning from scratch. And I want to show you an example. Next slide, please. This is, uh, you're probably familiar with this error. It's the error page in KPHP when a user controller is not found, or just a controller is not found. So this idea was probably pioneered by Ruby on Rails and Cake copied back in the before Cake One, and it was great because this was documentation when you made mistakes. It 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 was just brilliant because you could almost not read the documentation for the framework, just do mistakes and and it will correct you and tell you exactly what to do. Yet, I think that Cake and other projects in general abandoned this idea somehow, because it's also time consuming. So for, for example, uh, if you pay attention, maybe you use your beginner's mind hat again, and you read this error, and you can probably find three to five things to improve here for a beginner. I'm gonna just tell a few ones. It says users controller could not be found and the U is lowercase. We know that in KPHP and because it's also a, a standard in the style guide that the U should be uppercase. But there's nowhere in this message that tells you that U should be uppercase. Yet, we just copied the, the user's controller directly into the code example, which is not helpful at all. For a person learning it, they would think this is okay if I have users with all, all uh, lowercase as a class name. Um, another solution oh, or another idea to improve maybe is to have a link to the documentation, like how to create a controller or this is the style guide. You had a lowercase u, but this is why it needs to be with an uppercase, and so on and so on. So the more information we can provide to a user for solving a mistake and learning because of the mistake they made, I think the less uh, help requests and stack overflow questions we'll get uh, on the internet. Next slide. This is another error, and this shows almost, almost, almost that we just lost that vision some time ago. So we, at least we created a uh, missing route exception, so that is helpful. At least it's not invalid argument, like something or runtime exception. We're telling you at least that it's a missing route, and we show you something, some context for that. But you cannot do anything about it. At the bottom, there is some connected routes. If you know how this page looks like, that may help you figure out. But I think Cake has enough context to tell you what you did wrong. I think that if we help with matching with other params, it can tell you maybe, for example, that um, this plugin doesn't exist or is not connected. Or that, I don't know, the user's plugin in this 
um, sorry, the users controller in this plugin is actually not there. Stuff like that. So my vision, or what I have learned in this time about embracing the errors, is that errors should look like the next slide. This is not KPHP related at all. This error message comes from a, a small language that I've been using on my spare time called Elm. And the things that I want to see, uh, I want you to see here, is that someone made a typo. The typo, instead of writing phone number, they wrote phone number. And very clearly at the bottom, it shows what the typo is. Instead of phone number, it should, with a typo, should be just phone number. We can do a lot of this in KPHP as well. Like for example, when you create associations and you introduce a key with a typo, like foreign key, I always misspell foreign key for some reason. There are some words in English that I, can, I cannot just type correctly in any way. Um, I'm getting time up, but I also started one second. I got an error here. Okay, I'm back. Um, so yeah, I think that KPHP can do a lot uh, by just checking typos. If, if we expect some keys on an array, if we don't have a specific method for it, then we can just check uh, how, how to, the, the, or the challenge is how to make this understandable. How can we make it really great, uh, visually pleasing and visually understandable error message that can lead users who are beginning with the framework or, or are used to the framework but just having a, a bad day, they just tired, they didn't have their mar morning coffee to become just, to overcome a, a stupid problem. The amount of time I've, I've helped people with stupid errors like this can be counted by probably days if I sum up all the hours that I have spent on this. So maybe we should just spend this time on better error messages. Next slide. So if we improve the error messages and we are mindful and try to just pay attention to our judgments, we basically are already being kind to others. So having good error messages is just being kind to other people. Being kind doesn't mean to, to be soft and to be cheery all the time. It just means that you are mindful, you're just paying attention to the way you communicate to other people. So one way we communicate with a lot of people all the time is with a variation of this message that you have in the next slide, please. Which is read the fantastic manual. I think this can be found, a variation of this method can be found every single day in any internet forum, in our own Slack channel, in Reddit, in Hacker News, whatever you read, you will find something like this. And probably you can agree with me that this is not very kind. Yet, we haven't yet defined what kindness is. So let's go to the next slide, where I can explain what kindness is to me. Kindness, as I told you, is not just about being soft and, and, and sacrifice yourself or, or cry when other person is crying. For me, kindness is just to meet people at the level they currently are. So when they come with a simple question, you answer in the most simple way. So you don't, if, if someone wants to create a controller for users, you don't go and explain how domain-driven design works. They just want maybe to create a login action. And we, most of the time, try to help out of self-interest. But the way we help is not, most of the times, not the way people want to be helped. So kindness is about helping people in the way they want to be helped. It's not up to you, if you want to be a kind person, to dictate the, the way they want to be helped. 
So if they have a particular question they want answered, if you want to answer in a good way, then try to be at the level they want the answer. Um, being kind also means to understand that other people, sorry, not other people, like all people require uh, repetition for learning. So you probably know this from school. If you want to learn something, you need to repeat and repeat and repeat. If you want to become a great football player, you need to repeat and play and play and play. If you want to become great at programming, you need to program and program and so on. So you need to understand this if you want to be kind. Other people, it's not that like they're stupid, they need repetition. They may ask the question 100 times in a different way. The way they will learn it is by repeating the answer over and over, not in a non-kind way in which you just repeat the same words. Sometimes we need to learn by having variations of the same answer explained from different contexts. And sometimes people don't want to be helped. So it is kind to just basically not push yourself towards helping them. And that's okay. If they don't want to be helped, then there is no point in you trying to explain the concepts that you want to explore. So this is the typical case in which uh, you write your unwanted opinion on the internet. So if people have a very clear idea of what they want to do, the direction they want to follow, and they're convinced about it, and they have already told you that their way is the best way, then it's better to just shut up. These people don't want the help you're offering, and that's okay. So again, this also means it's the same idea. It's just meet the people at the level they currently are. Don't try to uh, look them from your high horse or try to lower yourself because you think they're not a, uh, at the level you are. So a way to practice kindness in code is in the next slide, which is to write code with readability of a goal. I think this is a goal by itself sometimes. But uh, since programming is not always a science, maybe the algorithms are, and the, some of the techniques are, but producing the code is sometimes more like uh, writing a poem. So writing code that is also readable is difficult, and it's a goal in itself. Uh, you can read books and books about this. So I'm, I'm not going to cover the specifics, but I'm just telling you that having this as a goal in, on your mind as you write the code is being kind to other people. Next slide, please. So for me, what makes code readable? And this is my checklist. The first one is that the intent is clear, that when you read the code, the code that is, or, or what you read is very clear. We suffer currently in PHP in this point, and in also other languages like JavaScript. When you are forced, maybe by popular opinion, that classes should be as focused as possible, that usually means as short as possible, then the intent is not clear in my view. It's not clear by opening a random file that this random file is to Okay, maybe it's clear that it sums one plus one, but why is it summing one plus one in the great scheme of the software that was written? So maybe sometimes the goal is not to have as little code as possible. Sometimes we think that uh, if we have less code in a file, that means that the intent is clearer, and it doesn't have to be necessary that way. It's easier. Sometimes we have a big file where if you read it linearly, it's very clear what the software is doing. For me, readable software is when indirection is minimized. If you have a big chain of objects and functions, 
that are called one after the other for doing a single thing and and you present this to another person and they try to read and you see the hoops they're going through to figure out how it works that's maybe not a great design i have i have suffered from this a lot sorry that was not clear i have made other people suffer <laughs> suffer this in the past uh, one example were the trades. I created a lot of trades when I created the ORM for Cake 3. So these trades have a, a crazy amount of indirection. And it caused me pain when reading this code back. I caused pain to Mark. It caused pain to everyone trying to change the code there. That was not very kind of me. So a lesson for me that uh, came up uh, from this experience is not that trades, trades are bad. It's that indirection needs to be minimized. The more code you have uh, around or, or maybe next to you, let's say in two, uh, one to two hoops of code, then the better, the, the more readable it is. Um, the other is that logic is linearized. If you have, um, I've been playing with Go lately, and for me, it's a bit painful sometimes having to see. Uh, call the method, if error, something. Call next method, if error, something. Next method, if error. I'm not sure if you have played with code ever, but it is quite painful uh, in this regard. It's, it looks linear because imperative is usually linear, but having to hoop or to, to jump from one context to the other, like the program is doing one linear thing, but to think every single time that if error, I need to jump somewhere else. That's painful for me to read. Uh, also, that the accidental complexity is kept to a reasonable low. This means that you don't introduce unnecessary layers if you don't need them. And I think that PHP is going on the opposite direction, unfortunately. I think that uh, we're trying to prove ourselves somehow as PHP developers that we're modern somehow. And we're making code less readable, with more indirection, with less linear logic, with more accidental complexity. And if I could, I, I would really love to revert this in the PHP world. I have an example. So in the next slide, um, this, is, this is typical KPHP code. Uh, you will find this, probably you have something like this. Uh, when I say something that is not linear, it's like if ID, throw exception, then if not article, throw exception, then if post, if, say the article, do something. This is not easy to follow. I mean, it's short, so in this case, it's sort of easy, but the more logic I add there, the more difficult will be for me to read and understand uh, all the difficult combinations. So if you have ever attended a talk called Object Calisthenics, uh, we had it at a, at a previous cake fest. Uh, they teach how to deal with this, which is maybe not have an else or try to not nest the ifs. Uh, there are many I good ideas for solving uh, this problem. Yet, something that I have been playing with lately, also uh, related to Elm, is that we could do a lot better. We could do something like in the next slide. This is just an idea that actually had this idea right before we uh, shipped KPHP 3.0. And it's that when I saw uh, the code that I produced that was in the previous slide, I thought that this is not really nice to read. It would be really nice to have something linear that when you read the logic, you know what's happening, but it's also protecting you uh, from this jumping from one context to the other. So in this example, we get the ID, we check it, and this creates a context having methods you can chain to do stuff. So check it and then get the ID. So whatever you return is passed to the next method or is stored in the context, so to speak. So after getting that, I can check, well, when it's not a post, I want to return a new exception. I'm not throwing the exception there though. I am just recording the intent of throwing an exception. And then we can just arbitrarily add methods. 
Why not? So we could add a method for patching the entity directly there and passing what table needs to, to be used for patching. And then we could, why not have a save method? And this is basically just storing the context of the computation you're using. And then at the end, if everything went okay, went success, I want to redirect. So if you have ever played with languages like uh, Elixir or Elm, this is basically how they work. They create a computation context that is linearized. When you read it, you know very well what's going on. I get the article. If it's not a post, it's an error. I patch the entity, I save it. And if it's not an error, I just redirect. I can add another method saying on error, redirect to another thing. So when error, another function, redirect to another thing with an error message. I think I will pursue this idea. I will open a ticket soon in the KPHP repo to go in this direction in a lot of places. I think that controllers are one of the places that could benefit the most from having this idea. And I invite you to, to come up with other places or to just maybe criticize this in any way you like uh, so that we can iterate on this and, and make something great for KPHP. So next slide. So as important it is to be kind to others, it is also important to be kind to yourself. I think being kind to others is easier in a way. I think most of you would agree that uh, maybe if you if you have a relative who is suffering some sort of illness or, or going through a bad time, what, what comes to your mind is that you want to hug them, to support them, to tell them nice things, to be there with them, right? So if they made something bad, a mistake, they, they did something that they're going through a rough patch, then you would probably support them in a way, especially if there's, they are a loved one, like your, your partner. But on the opposite, we are less likely to do that with ourselves. If we do something bad, if we're not as good as we hope we were, instead of being supportive with ourselves, what we do is to criticize and be harsh on ourselves. And this comes from the false belief that if we don't push ourselves, then we won't get better. And actually scientific research has shown the opposite. People who are self-compassionate, that would be the scientific term today, but who are kind to themselves actually learn faster. They repeated this experiment multiple times in different years, and they have shown scientifically that people who are kind to themselves, meaning they do not criticize and they are not harsh on themselves when making a mistake, they learn and improve faster. Next slide. So uh, is, is this important to take care of yourself? And these are my tips for becoming a better programmer or a better person in general. One is that you don't have to be perfect all the time. Uh, I don't produce perfect code all the time, probably never. But when I realize that I made a bad decision by design, I don't take it personally. I know that was me at the state that was at that time, and then I can improve it. That was a learning experience. This also comes back to the tip of embracing the error. There's no need to be more uh, or be harsher on yourself than you are on to others. So if you imagine another person doing the same mistake and you don't have a, a, like a rough or harsh way of addressing to them in your imagination, then you should probably do the same with yourself. And it's important to remember that it is okay to make mistakes. And mistakes should be applauded. They should be embraced. They should be celebrated. And the thing that we should be celebrated the most is the ability to change. I think the most or the single most amazing feature trait of a human being is the ability to change. 
So today you may have a, an opinion on something. Today you may not be able to do something. Today you may not be able, like me, I was, I never thought I would be able to create uh, an ORM or contribute for so many years to a framework, but I changed. And then I was able to, and I think that should be celebrated. Not me, <laughs> not myself. It should be celebrated, the ability to change that each one of you has. So you can constantly improve. And a way to be kind to yourself, to your future self, and a way to embrace your ability to change is the next step, the next slide, which is to write code you won't fear changing. This is basically a synonym for um, write maintainable code. Unfortunately, I have come to discover that most of the times, writing readable code and writing maintainable code are in opposition. I have not a clear idea of why this happens. Yet, when using another languages that can help you solve this opposition, you realize that we could get more help from the language. One thing that I regret of uh, what's happening today in the PHP world is that HHVM is not more popular and it's not more compatible to PHP as it is today. It's basically, in my view, abandoned uh, community-wise by the Facebook developers because the language itself helps a lot uh, making the code both readable and maintainable. I haven't defined what maintainable code is actually, actually is. So go to the next slide, please. For me, maintainable code is code that you don't fear other person changing for you. So if you give the code that you produced to someone else and tell them to refactor it and to improve it, if you don't have a fear, and this person doesn't have a fear either, uh, that they will introduce new bugs, then that is maintainable code. I mean, that is the end goal, right? But uh, traditionally, we have uh, mitigated the risk of introducing new bugs using automated tests and using some automated code analysis and using some specific design patterns, etc. But uh, I think, especially automated tests, I think they fail a lot at predicting bugs because you can only have tests for stuff that you could think about when testing. So if you create the code and the test, you will probably create the test unconsciously in a way so they pass. You will not think of all the, the edge cases that may come up. So a future, well, for me the future, sorry, of KPHP and maybe software in general is that we should make APIs that are just impossible uh, that when using them, you introduce some sort of error of, or uh, ambiguity. Another future thing that I should, or maybe it's not in the future, other languages are using it already, and I think we should embrace them in, in the PHP land, and hopefully in Cake as well, is using another type of automated tests called property testing or fuzzy testing, which is bombarding your code with random data and see what happens. So usually this random data will reveal problems in your code base. So I'm gonna just show you, I don't have great tips right now because also the, the talk would be too long. Uh, go to the next slide. I don't have specific tips for uh, writing maintainable code this time. I'm just gonna show you how we evolved from something less maintainable to something more maintainable. So in Cake 2, in Cake 1 as well, we used to have a find all where you can see my typos. I misspelled fails and conditions without an N. I didn't realize until I had an error, an exception somewhere. But in Cake 3, 
those mistakes are not possible because they are now uh, methods. Unfortunately, PHP is not a compiled language, so we cannot actually check that the methods exist. But at least you will get a bad method error uh, in your tests. So I think that the future uh, change for Cake could be to remove all the arrays. Well, either uh, changing all the arrays uh, options into methods or having some sort of CLI checker that looks at the conditions, uh, uh, at the keys of the array, sorry, and can detect, like, well, this really looks like conditions. Maybe you meant the key conditions or something like that. So even though we improve the design by making the API more robust, or more difficult to make errors on, I also made mistakes. So in the next slide, you can see a mistake. So I can find, select, add somewhere, and then I can insert. What? How come I can still call insert and I will get not, no errors until I try to execute the query? So a future change for me uh, in Cake would be to use the assert keyword in the PHP language. Assert is uh, something that has existed since, I don't know, PHP 4. But now it is really, really cheap to use this in your code base. The goal would be to add a search everywhere in KPHP checking for common mistakes. And this will throw specific exceptions that with really nice error messages will guide the users to understand that it is not possible to select an insert in the same object. And still, that would happen at runtime, which is a pity, but it's a lot better than what we have today. Um, next slide, please. One of the final tips would be to be understanding. Be understanding, that's explained in the next slide, which is basically to ask more questions. Be understanding means to not never assume other people's intention. It is always better to ask what they mean. And um, I'm not speaking about code here anymore. This is more about building a community. I have experienced many, many times along these years how many people problems we have uh, when, when creating software together. And we have uh, extra difficulty as a group because we're a remote group. Each one of us is sitting at a different city in the world. We have people in the five continents. With, with different cultures, with different languages, with different ways of using English. So when we assume what other people try to say to you or the face they had when they say it or this, the feeling they had when saying it, that creates problems. So a more healthy approach would be to assume that other people are addressing to you always with good intentions, even if it does not look like it. And if you are still in doubt, it's better to just ask more questions. It's, it's always safer and, and healthier for the community to come from the position that everyone is doing their best for the community. Also, if someone makes a mistake, it's better to assume that it was not intentional. Or it's better to assume that they are not stupid it's healthier to think that they were just confused at the time or that they were tired or that they were maybe depressed and so on. And most importantly is to uh, not believe in karma in a way, in the, in the Western understanding of karma. It's like, don't create karma for people. So don't define people by their mistakes. Don't blame people by the mistakes they made in the past. Don't punish people for mistakes they made in the past. They can change. So a healthier view of the world is to assume people always want to change and they're trying their best for changing. 
And with that, I would like to finish with the last tip in the next slide, which I won't go into details, which is to just be open to change. Uh, you probably know that all of us are afraid of changing. Um, if you had presented me this talk 10 years ago or 15 years ago uh, with ways of changes, I would probably would have dismissed it because I would have thought I'm okay the way I am. And that was okay for me at the time. But be open to questioning the way you are today. You can change in positive ways. So maybe you are great today, but you can even be greater than what you are today. And maybe these 10 tips don't apply to you. Maybe you already do them in your daily life. But um, for, for you that maybe are not applying all of them, just a few, maybe try to go back. I will publish this talk so you can review my 10 tips and be open to change something about yourself. And I'm pretty sure it will pay off. So thank you so much. I will, let, I will leave this slide uh, for you to, to see it, to remember that you should be open to change, and I will be accepting questions from now on. Thanks. I can't hear anything. Someone is asking questions in the way. Maybe there's no time for questions. I'm not sure if it's still working or not. We had this one thing going here. Check now. Jose. Does anyone have questions for Jose? Let me message him on Slack. Questions? Okay. Trying to that last piece of equipment you've seen in last night is not really working. We had it working great for this morning, but it's no not working. Okay. All right. We're gonna get set up for the next talk. And Jose, this is recorded, so we're saying thank you again. Is everybody this talk again? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if I have time to, to answer questions, uh, but I can see in the KFS channel that where do you get inspiration for KPHP ORM? Um, mostly from another ORM in the Python world called SQL Alchemy, uh, but also uh, mostly, I would say, I got some of the syntax from SQL Alchemy, but mostly from stuff that I was unhappy with in the K2 or um, so most of it were just ideas that I had, the way I create queries when I create manual queries myself um, directly on MySQL. So I wanted those to be easier when writing them in PHP. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I see that I'm really behind schedule, so let's get moving. I will answer questions on Slack anyway. So bye-bye. <laughs>